awesome.
Yes! Good morning! How are you guys doing? Yes, how are you doing out there? Welcome to church. We are so thankful to have you here. What a great day to worship God, right? And if you're at home, you're even like, yes, what a great day, because we got poured on as we came into church today. Hey, we are excited to have you here. We are talking about some good things in the good news of Jesus Christ, and that we have what? Victory in the name of Jesus, and we pronounce that over you who are in this place today and you who are watching online. We are so thankful to have you join us today, Come, however you choose to worship, and we've got a video to show you exactly what we mean. Check this out. To break every chain. I'm sorry. I was feeling it. I'm sorry. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I know that's right. Let us not become weary in doing good. <laughs> for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I'm trying. They will run and not grow weary. They I'm will walk weary. and not be faint. Hey, let's walk. I'm going to see your victory. I'm gonna see a victory <laughs> for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men, huh? Ah. <gasps> don't pull it, you're pulling it, you're pulling it. Oh, I'm sorry, you're pulling I'm it. sorry. You're pulling it, you're pulling it. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood Amen. Amen, amen. Your love is devoted. Your praise will never be 
God, we come to you today and we say, God, that it is better to be in your courts, even if we have to be a janitor, even if we have to do the lowest job possible, but to be in your presence. Today, we pray not like the Pharisee who has it all together, but we pray like the tax collector who says, God, have forgiveness on me, a sinner. For God, when we come closer to you, the closer we are to you, the more that we see our own inadequacies. When I compare myself to someone else, another person walked down the street, I'm like, God, look at how good I am compared to that. When I see how I raise my kids, when I see the size of my house or the newest car that I drive. But God, I'm not comparing myself to other people. I'm not comparing myself to what may be on the other side. I compare myself to you. And when I and we compare ourselves to you, God, 
we see that there's still, still lots of work to be done. So we are your people, called by your name, to just proclaim, God, you are God, and I, we are not. I don't need more stuff. I don't need more drama. I don't need more bad news. But what I do need is I do need more of you. More of you in more of me. More of your grace, more of your forgiveness for me. So today, God, will you unite your people from all over? Those who are watching right here in Richmond Heights and those who are watching online from wherever they may be to declare this as the prayer and as our praise. We need you. And you are faithful to show up to the people who call on your name. So here we are, God, calling out together just how much we need you. May you lift up this song as a prayer to him. I need you more more than yesterday I need you more more than words can say I need you
Father God, as we just continue to pour out our praise to you, may we find an area in our life that we can just automatically say, God, you have space to move and to deal with me as you see fit. Father God, in every possible way, from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, may you get first place. May you have first option. God, today as we open up your word, may it be life-giving to us. As this music has been to my soul, may these words, God, be something that inspire us to live the words and actions of Jesus. May we not just be hearers of the word today. May we be doers as well. As you call us to a higher place. We just need you, God. We need you today, God. We need you today. If that's true for you, whether you're online or here, will you just tell him that? Will you just say that, God? Man, if there's ever a time I needed you, it's right now. Will you just give him like 10 seconds of time to just invade your space and you just tell him, God, God, I just need you. I need you in my life. I need you in my home. God, I need you in our church. God, I need you to deal with the, the issues, God, that surround me. God, I need you, God, to help me get out of bed every morning. God, I need you, Lord, at night to deceive, sleep in peace. God, I need you in every moment of the day. I choose to have you with me. God, will you choose me again to be with you? Oh, Lord, I feel your presence. I feel your spirit in this place. God, I pray that somehow supernaturally it can go to the people who are watching through their phones and TVs, God, and that you would just reach them in a great way today with your Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you. And now we open up space for you to speak your word of life into us today. We pray all these things in the greatest name of all names. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen, amen. Can we just give God some praise? He's worthy of it today. He's worthy of it today. If you're with us, you may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Trent, for that. We had some great things. If you're watching online, we are doing our best to give, incorporate some new things. And with new things, mean well, we get some crazy things happening at the same time. We might lose some uh, uh, sound for a moment. We might have a Beyonce moment. We had a Beyonce movement, and uh, our air was just so hot in here, it blew Trent's paper all the way down. So you guys online got to see all that up close, and so we just give you a thumbs up to watch that. But hey, this is church. We love it. This is what we do, and God, in the middle of our craziness, can meet us exactly where we are, and so we'll just take it, because that's how God takes us. So excited to have you join us today. Uh, if you did not know or you were not aware, Pat Radica had passed away um, in June. We had her memorial service yesterday. Beautiful thing. If you have not yet seen it, it is on our Vimeo account and also on our Facebook page as well. If you would like to check that out, it was, it was just a, a, a beautiful time uh, honoring her and just, uh, uh, just being there for her family. So we're excited uh, to be able to uh, just memorialize somebody, certainly in, in this time as well. Hey, there's lots of different things that are going on in church. We are getting ready to uh, do a lot of renovating online. We want you to know that there is a Bible study that happens every Thursday. If you are interested in that Bible study, we certainly want you to know about that Bible study. We want you to, to, to make time for that Bible study. One of the, the greatest needs right now that we have is that we need to try to connect people across the board. We are looking at starting a men's group, a women's group as well, as well as having our midweek study as well. You'll see I've been trying to post videos uh, just throughout the week as well. Even if you're not on Facebook, you can also get them through our church email as soon as you uh, are linked up to our email. 
we have that for you as well. And then we have our kids have a Zoom call at 4? Four. 4, yes, I knew that. I had no questions about it, 100% accuracy. I knew what I was talking about. 4 o'clock today, um, and you can uh, have your kids sign on for that, and they just kind of yell a little bit, and Carolyn just tries to keep the peace, but it's not something you have to worry about for a few minutes, so I take that as often as I can. Hey, uh, I am I'm excited to be in the third week of our sermon series called Breathing Room. Can you say Breathing Room? That's great, especially you who have your mask on. It's like, yes, I would especially like some breathing room in my life. And so uh, today we have a very short scripture, but it is a great scripture, and we are excited about that. Can you stand wherever you are in honor of God's word? And man, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to get to the end, Danielle. They're going to be excited about the end, okay? They're going to be excited about the end. They might not like all the things in the middle. Yeah. They're going to be excited about the end. This today comes from Luke chapter 16, verse 13. Very short verse with wonderful, wonderful depth to it. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Around here, we like to say that this is the word of God, and we respond, thanks be to God. Let's try that together. This is the word of God for us today. Thanks be to God. You may be seated wherever you are. Thank you for doing that. You know, when I read the Bible sometimes, um, there's a part of my personality that starts to, um, I don't know, get a little, I don't know, feisty. And I read a passage like this, and the feistiness rises in me, because as soon as someone or something tells me that I can't do something, it, it, it's, like, it's like something happens to me, like inside of me that... that that automatically says, oh yeah, I take that as a challenge. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't do that. My mom used to say that all the time. And instead of that being some sort of like deterrent for me to do that, it was in fact something that inspired me to do that. So like, you can't jump that. You can't do that. I mean, like my friends knew that about me. Like they used that, I think, to, to their humor and to their amusement that they would just dare me or say you can't do that and as soon as you say you can't do something it piques my interest like oh yeah you might not be able to do that but oh i can i'm gonna find a way this this passage here says no one can serve two masters and i'm like are you sure about that like no one ever can do that so i did a little research this week and here's what i came up with as a challenge to that portion of the passage like, I can't do that? Is that what the passage is really saying? Like, I can't serve two masters? Well, I came up with some ways I think that you can. First way that I found out is I can serve two masters successfully. So, like, I have one master at this point, and then I have another master at this point. So if you use masters in the broad sense of the word of who you work for, you might work for one boss for a portion of your life, 10, 20 years, and then you work for another boss for 10 or 20 years. So I can serve two masters. I can work for two companies. I can give everything to them in those ways. I can work for two masters successfully. Number two is I can say that I have two masters while serving one in reality and one in an imagination, imaginative sort of way. Like I can say I have two masters, but in reality I have one and I have another one in my mind that I can say, yeah, I serve that. I didn't say serve them well. I just said I can say that I can serve two. Or the third thing is, I can serve two masters, but I cannot serve them equally. At some point, I'm going to have to choose which one of my masters has the top priority in my life. Does that make sense? So, so some of us have had in our life bosses of bosses type of thing. You have many different layers of people who are above you type of thing. And so at some point, you have got to decide which boss you're going to listen to, which 
person, you're going to say, I'm going to have to choose this way or this way, especially if the two bosses, two masters, start to go in a different direction. Here's what I kind of figured out about this verse. And I think it's really apparent at the end of what it's trying to say about being masters, because eventually we can't serve two masters equally. You can serve two masters, but not equally, which means one is no longer the utmost power source, utmost authority in your life, right? So you can have a mini master, but you can have an absolute master. Here's what I think is also very interesting in this text. It doesn't say that we are without masters ever. I think that that's kind of important when we talk about the idea of freedom in our country right now and the idea of what we want to be in our life. Even with Christ, we will always serve something or someone. It is our choice what and who we serve. That's just how we're wired. That is how we're built. That's how we were created. I, I, I found this to be true in here. You can serve to or at least you can say you can serve to, but the more unlike your masters are, the more on the opposite ends of the extreme they are, you cannot serve both. The further away that the two masters are, the less that you can serve them at all. Eventually you have to choose a road. Fundamentally, at some point, you're going to have to choose one or you're going to have to choose another. So I posted this on Facebook. I, I've got uh, so, some, some crosses up here, and this one says believe, and I've got this one, which I am temporarily borrowing from Carolyn, and I hope that she reminds me or not to give this back. And on this right here, I've got Jackson on a $20 bill. And in our country, in the way that we are wired, in the way that we think about life, in the way that we act and react and interact, God is putting this in our attention to say, hey, in here you can trust or you can believe in this. But you think that you might be able to serve both. It just depends on what day you are. So if you're watching today online, you're here at church, man, congratulations. You have done your part. You have been able to say, I am standing up and I believe in Jesus. You have done it for an hour. You're hoping no longer than an hour. You know what I'm saying? Don't get, don't get preaching hard to hear pastor. And then you go back out to your life. But here's my question to us. Is this really is this really what we serve? You can look online, and you can find some great stats, some great, um, some great research that is done on what happens when you have income. Right now in America, we spend between 100 and 101% of everything we make. So what happens is if your income goes up, you would think that you would have more room in your life because now if my income has finally gone up, I will have more room that finances aren't an issue. But whether you are making less than $30,000 a year, if you're making $50,000 a year, if you're making $100,000 a year, even if you're making a million dollars a year, check this out. As your income goes up, Here's the research. Your spending goes up at the same level. How crazy is that? So if you think that if you could only have more money that you would be happy or that you would have some breathing room, that, that that's what will do it for you. But statistics are that as your income goes up, so does your expenses. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about dollars and cents. We're talking about how you can have breathing room in your financial life. And here's what I'm talking about. Breathing room is this. As your income goes up, your spending might go up, but it does not go up at the same level. The difference between your income and your spending is what we call breathing room. And as I have seen people in church, as I have seen people in their own, uh, just out in the world, just talking to them about finances and things that are going on in their life, Man, I tell you what, it's so difficult 
because they are like, I am stressed out because of finances. Do you know one of the top two reasons for divorce in our country? One of the top two reasons of every survey in the last 30 years has to do with finances. Couples went to a, to a time where they could no longer uh, afford the life they have. Somebody lost their job. Somebody had uh, health issues, anything like that. And at the same time, all of that was going on, right? As they were going on, they continued to think that their marriage was more about this. And it just brought more and more stress into their homes. More and more stress. I don't think that people get divorced because of finances. But I think that it is such a pressure gauge in their life that it impacts every other way. So I, I'm, I'm hoping today, if you who are watching here, you are here, if you are a Christian, this, this is good news for us. This is something we need to talk about. But this is good even if you're not a Christian to be able to do. To say, hey, you know what? We need some room. We need some breathing room in our finances. But if you happen to be hopping on this and you happen to say, hey, I'm watching church today. I'm checking out Richmond Heights and Nazarene Church. That Pastor Stephen, uh, he, he's crazy. I'd like to see him. And for some reason today, he's wearing a suit. Well, you'll have to leave that. I had a suit on yesterday. I just figured just make it a weekend of suits type of thing. Just throw it out there. Get everything out of the closet type of thing. But what if you stumbled here and you say, I am a Christian. Finances and our relationship with God is no longer a good idea. But it's a command to figure out who we serve. Now, how do I do that? Well, I, I, I like to talk to you about this. If you have no breathing room, right, chances are that if your income is here and your spending is here, and you're like, no, pastor, that's not me. My income's like here. <laughs> okay. If your income is here and your spending is here and you have no breathing room, when you lose breathing room between your finances, oftentimes you become a slave to money. Every decision you make, every major choice you make is based on money. When you are brought up with an option, when God calls something to your attention, the first thing you say is, how can I afford it? Or am I able to better live this way if I had more money? So you might get a job offer and you have a good job, but it doesn't pay you as much. And so you think about getting a better job, not because it's better holistically, but it's better because it gives you more money, right? And if it gives you more money, then it must be better. What's that mean? Money is your God. And you're a slave to that because you're making decisions, not what is best on you holistically, not what's best on you fin financially alone. You're, you're, you're basing it on just what is the driving force, authority in your life. The same is also true on the other end. What if you felt like God was telling you to leave your job? But because of the money, you might not be willing to let that go. Now, I want to pause here for a second because some of you are already starting to write your resignation letters online as they watch this type of thing. Like, I'm not saying be a, a bad steward or, or, or to say, hey, this is not what, God doesn't want me here and I'm, I'm leaving right here and so my family's gonna uh, be kicked out of their home and we're gonna default on our mortgage and we're not gonna have food on the table. I, I'm saying that if God is telling you that it's time to move on, but the money is too good, then you are pulled between two different masters that you have to make a decision on who you are going to believe most. Does that make any sense today? I'm hoping so. If you're here, can you nod at me one way or another? You're like, yes, yes, but if you're giving money, Pastor, I'm taking it. I'm going to keep this $20 really close, Carolyn, okay? I'm a little worried about this group here today. If they have no breathing room, we become a slave. If every major decision is based on or against because of money, then we might be a slave to that. But I think that, that, I think that we need to understand that Christians are all often Christians are often talking about how the devil is our enemy. And I, I believe he is, he is our enemy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, the devil made me do it type of thing. Or the devil, man, he, he's seeking to, to still kill and destroy and that kind of thing. But can I tell you something? Jesus talked about Satan, the evil one, demonic forces. He talked about them sometimes, right? But do you know what he talked about more often than not? 
Dollar bills, y'all. Satan might be your enemy. But more than Satan having a hold of your heart, this does. This does. And so it's time for us to talk a little bit about this so we can choose who we're really serving. Does that make sense? Y'all already you're salivating looking at that 20. I'm going to put that back down, okay? Settle down, Trent. Settle down. Let me give you some key points today about how we can remind ourselves that we can serve God and not money. You ready for this? Number one is this. God gets me first. God gets me first. Before I check my account balance, before I get up to go to work, God gets me. That's how it starts. If already you're in a rush to go to work, to go to work, to make money, to make ends meet, but you don't pause in the morning and say, God, you get my first. You get my best. You get my first energy. You get my best energy. Before I ever go there, God, I need you type of thing. Does that make sense? God gets my first. Now, I don't, I don't say a lot about this topic, okay? I, you might think that I'm a pretty progressive type of guy, but when it comes to one issue, I am as about as traditional as it goes. When I was younger, I played on a very, very good baseball team. I mean, we're talking Little League all-star type of thing. You know, like the Little League World Series? Uh, we got to the very end of our region to get to the Little League World Series. We were traveling everywhere to be able to be the best 11, 12-year-old baseball team in the entire world. But my parents told the coaches from the time I started, if a game was going to be on Sunday, particularly Sunday morning, we were out. Now, I'm not held back in a lot of areas in my life, but do you know what happened to me because I wasn't able to play those games? I didn't get to play in other games. Somebody else would take my spot because Stephen wasn't going to be there. Most of the traveling games were on the weekends, and so I could play on Saturday, but I wasn't going to be there on Sunday. I mean, very, very, very few times did I ever play on any Sunday, whether it's Sunday afternoon or whatever. But my parents said, Sunday is a day for church. And I'm sorry, guys, but that's just, that's just how it works. And now I do a job where I have to work every Sunday. How crazy is that? You know what I'm saying? Thanks, Mom. Appreciate that. When I talk to young people today and they're saying, ah, I got to work on Sunday. I'm like, hey, you know what? You got to do what you got to do. But for me and my household, as often as we can in our own way, we say Sunday is the Lord's day. He gets me first. And if you have to make a decision between I got to make some money and I got to go to church, that should never be something that is a hard push for us because of these two things. I remember when I had uh, left University of Louisville, I was going to go down to Trebekah. I was going to have to pay a lot of money to go to a private school, and I didn't know how I was going to afford it. And I was working six days a week to be able to make ends meet as a waiter at Steak and Shake. I'm telling you what, what a great time that was. I can tell you a story after story. Not in church, after church probably. I can tell you some of those stories. But when it came to Sunday, when they asked me to work, I said, I can't. When it came to Saturday night for me to work, I said, I can't. If I worked overnight, I could not work overnight. Because I was not willing to work until 4 or 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday so that I could be rested to go to church. I just was not willing to do that. Do you know how much money I could have made on a Saturday night? I mean, that's the night that people like to eat out type of thing. And yet I, I chose, no, Sunday's the Lord's day. God gets me first. And I'm not just talking about Sunday. I'm talking about every day. Does God get your best every day? Do you put in as much time, attention, and the depth of relationship with God as you do in work? Have you ever had a work day that just left you exhausted? You're like, woo, this type of thing. Some of you are retired. Have you ever worked around your house so often? You're cleaning this, cleaning that, and you just go at the end of your day, you were just exhausted, uh, like emotionally and physically, like, woo, I put in a lot of work today. My mom's retired now, and she works harder, I think, now around her home than she even did at work. Like, she's always just busy doing something. Can I ask you a question? When's the last time you were spiritually so tired because you gave it your all? Like, you prayed through. You kept reading. 
and kept reading and kept reading and kept spending time with God where you just were like, whoo, I'm done. I'm tired because you gave it all to God. In our culture, man, we have an issue trying to figure out how to spend time with God well. Spend time with God so that he gets our first energy. I often like to say this around my home for me, just in, 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 in me. God gets my first and he gets my best. My family gets my next best. And my job and the people that God has entrusted me with, they get my third best. Now you might think, wow, pastor, I'm, no, I'm never going to be better than top three in your life. And I'm like, yes. Because if I don't live by that example, then I'm teaching you something that's not biblical. I'm teaching you something that you should not emulate. That's not something that you should do. My kids deserve to have a father. They're, I'm the only one they got. I'm the only one they got. And I believe that God has entrusted those kids to me, right? And so that, that's where it comes from. And God gets my first, and it filters through that. But you know what I've seen in my life? When God gets my first, I have energy to do the rest. I have energy to do the rest. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching today, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm preaching it up, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to button. I'm going to I'm gonna do it a couple times over. Uh, here's the second thing. When I talk about serving two masters, now that was really deep. Let's get really simple, all right? This is a great one. You'll love this. Check on the cheddar. Check on the cheddar. I came up with lots of lines that I liked. Listen to a couple more lines that I didn't put up. Watch the wad. Spy on your money. Peep the paper. All of those things are true, but this is how I can make, make sure that I am not serving two masters. When I budget and when I watch my money and I keep a check on my cheddar and I'm peeping my paper, I know where my money is going. Can I tell you what happens to a lot of young people in their life? They have no idea where their money is going. They didn't learn that. Some of you who are older, man, you came up like you pinch every single penny you know of. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you don't know where your money's going, then you have the potential to have your money run wild over you. But when you have power over where your money goes, you have authority over it, not it having authority over you. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying. For some of you people who want to start a budget, some of you who have no idea about what a budget even looks like, you're like, I ain't got enough money to budget. That's not true. You have no breathing room because you don't know where it is. Here's what I want you to do. Two months. For two months, I want you to count every bit of money that goes out. I want you to look at every different expense. I'm talking about you go to the, you, you go to the gas station and you buy gas and you go in and buy a pack of juicy fruit type of thing. I'm talking about track every single expense that you make for two months, 60 days, and you will be able to see exactly where your money goes. Now, here's the thing. If you're watching this online, if you have a, a phone, some sort of smart device, I've got a free app for you called Mint, M-I-N-T, that will help you track every different expense you make. You can, uh, you can connect your credit cards and your bank account to that. So that all you have to do is connect it with that and say you pay everything in credit card. At the end of your month, your credit card statement comes in. It will show you how much money you have spent. And then it will itemize all of those different things to show you where you spent money. Food, groceries, uh, gas, whatever it is. Uh, miscellaneous expenses, entertainment, anything like that. You can show up on that and you can see where your money goes. It's a great time to remind you that God has called us to give to the church. But you're like, I don't have any money to give to the church. I bet if you checked your expenses for 60, 60 days, I bet you would find that you have some money going all kinds of different places that aren't as valuable as you would like them to be in other areas of your life. And so you're, you're, you're caught when you check on your cheddar. When you watch your wad of money go somewhere, you get a little bit more aware of where your money's going and how you're spending it. Can I be honest with you? Like, come on, man. Like, don't hear me say this. You can't spend money, okay? Like, I'm not a Dave Ramsey type clone that tells you this is how you have to do this or that, that kind of thing. Like, like you have to, you, you can't be in any debt in, in, in any way and that kind of thing. You got to buy everything in, in cold, hard cash. Look, I, I don't know how all that works for you, but here's what I do know. I do know this, that if you let your money decide where it goes, 
and you look at all the little things you spend on, it will end up making into something bigger. And every part of financial responsibility is to make sure that we have it under control instead of it controlling us. So there's two ways that you can help with budgeting. After you look at budgeting, you can either make more money or you can spend less. There's two things about budgeting. It's very, very, very simple, very simple financial advice here. If you don't have enough breathing room, then you have two options. You can either make more money or you can spend less. And when you check on your money, check what it's doing for you and where you're spending it, you are creating space for God to speak into your financial life. Does that make sense? My mom taught me long ago to take a checkbook register and write all my checks. And I'm like, mom, I ain't got time for all that, but I can use an app. You know what I'm saying? I can use an app. I can check my spending. And I love at the end of the month, I do it every month, I look at our credit card statements. Because we want to buy everything on credit card. We pay off our credit card statement right away. We don't have extra fees. But I like to do that because it's taking all of my expenses, taking it into one place so that I know where we spent money. You're allowed to spend money. You, you can live and spend money. You don't have to feel bad about spending money. You don't have to feel bad about giving your spouse a gift. You don't have to feel bad about going out to a nice dinner. And at the same time, you might want to check if you're spending hundreds of dollars on takeout, that might be the time you're saying, maybe I should cook more at home. Maybe I need to do a little something different. Does that make sense? It's, it, it's about seeing how much you're doing and just creating some room for moderation in your life. How we finish one phrase of, of, of how our finances goes or who's in authority over us figures out how we see our foundation. And it's the song we sing before. There's one line that we say that teaches us about what has authority over us. And it's the line this, I need. When I use the phrase, I need, followed with whatever it is after the, the fact, I am saying that there is something that I need that I don't have that would better complete my life that I do not currently have at my disposal. I need blank. Do you, do you really need a new car? Or is it better to say, I need a car that's not gonna break down on me every time I get in it. Those are two different sayings. I need a bigger house? Or you know what, it would really be helpful if I had a bigger house. And I started thinking about the language we use. My kids, man, oh my goodness, I hope they're watching. I hope you kids are watching. You better be watching church. It's Sunday morning. You better. God get you first type of thing. And my kids every morning, they're like, I need this. I need that. I, I, I need to play video games. It's raining outside. I, 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 I need to play with toys. You know what? Let me just tell you something, kids. I, I mean, I go straight like father figure on them at this point. You need sleep. You need to eat food, nutritious food, not just junk food that you want all the time, not just more carbs. And you need Jesus. And then you need to listen to your mom and dad. I throw that in too just to make sure. The older I get, the more that I see there's not a lot of things that I need. I want that but I don't need that. Can I tell you something? It's better to say I want something than I owe something. Don't let money control you. Don't live for money. Don't live because you go to work just so you have to make what? Enough money. You will come to despise life. You will come to despise the things that are good about life all because you have only started and continue to work on that, that area, that job, just because you need the money. Here's what I want to leave you with today. Creating breathing room financially may lower your standard of living. Do you hear me? I'm going to say it again. Creating breathing room in your financial life may lower your standard of living, but it will raise the quality of your life. Sound good?
when I create breathing room, I might lower the standard of my life, but I create greater quality of life. Because those are the things that are the pressures that consume us. Uh, I have uh, up here a, the cross. I have up here Carolyn's $20 that I am now publicly saying that I'm going to try to remember to give back. And then I have this wonderful thing right here. Can you zoom in on this at all? Can you, can you see this? Can you guys see what this is? It looks like some sort of plastic utensil. At like 10.30 at night, I, I messaged uh, Phil and Trent and Danielle. I said, guys, I need help! I yell at them sometimes with exclamation points. That way they know that I'm being serious because sometimes I'm not. And Phil and Trent, you know what they do to me? They send me back memes and things like that, you know. But Danielle, God bless her, you know, she's a super Christian. She's real. She says, Pastor, how can I help you? And I said, I need a spork. <laughs> 10 30 at night, I'm like, I need a spork. It is a spork, which I believe the only way you can find this is in like Taco Bell type of thing, right? KFC and KFC. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, KFC. But a spork is both what? A, a spoon and a fork. And, you know, they try to do this because, like, like, you know, fork has a little bit more depth to it. A spoon, you know, you've got, you've got the, the whole bottom of it, that, that type of thing. But you know what my experiences with sporks have been in my life? No, leave it up to Kentucky to have, you know, <laughs> sporks type of thing. It's not heavy enough to hold on something that's liquidy, right? And it doesn't have enough tong distance so that I can really d dig into my chicken the way I want. So like, I, I want to eat the whole, whole mouthful of something. Like, like I get, I'm a little dainty bites type of thing. I can't even get the whole thing on there. And it's so flimsy that I can't, I can't get it on there. So my soup leaks out type of thing. Any kind of sauce or gravy leaks out. But I can't also quite get everything that I want on there. This right here, guys, at 1030 at night last night, this is what I came up with that we are trying to be like. We just try to do too much. But no one, not even a spork, can serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other. Despise one. Love another. But you cannot serve two masters. If we want to be Christians, called by the name of Jesus, with the heart of Jesus, you've got to understand <laughs> that this cannot be combined. You will either serve one or you will serve the other. You cannot be a spork. Stop trying to be a spork. No one is happy with a spork. And if that doesn't get you, well, I don't know what does. Because we brought KFC, Taco Bell. I've used, I've used the phrase, check on your cheddar, in a sermon that somehow I think made sense. But more importantly, we have said this. God goes first and if we do that everything else finds its place and its pleasure when God is our foundation amen can we pray together today God I pray for us that we would not be so inclined to to work for money but we would work as a way to bring you glory when we feed our families God, we think that it's an honor. When we are able to take care of our finances, we believe that's honoring to you. When we, when we pay our bills that, that we have, God, instead of letting them go in default, we believe that that's an honoring thing to you, God. But Lord, today we are called to accountability of how we look at money. God, we pray that money would have less power over us. Less power over our our coming and going, less power over our, our emotions, God, and that we would lean into you. God, some of us who are watching this today are in jobs that we don't like. 
but those jobs pay the bills and we say thank you. And God, some of us are looking for more. Change how we talk about the more. For at the end of the day, what do we really need? What do we really, really need? We need more of you. We need more of you. And when we have our focus right on the author and perfecter of our faith, we will see that, God, you have everything, everything lined out for us so that we can be successful as your children, the children of the Most High King. So, God, today, I pray for those who have financial pressures. I pray for those today who have issues just dealing with finances and trying to figure out how they're ever going to get out of this. God, I pray that they would be seen today like the little widow who only gave two little cents, two little pennies. But you saw that, God, and you honored her and lifted her up. God, it's not the amount we give, but God, it is the heart and the ambition in which we give. May we give you our first. May we give you our best. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're watching this online today as a way to say, hey, I'm committing to this. I'm committing to change and making breathing room in my financial life that eventually will impact the way that I see God in the church. I want you just to type this. God, I commit to give you my first. And I commit to give you my best. If you would just comment down there, man, we would love to see you do that. And we will hold you to that accountability. We believe that God is doing a great thing. Amen. And we want to send you off with a special song today. They are going to rock this out called Holy Water. As you're doing that today, know that you can give online if you give here today. If you have an offering, you can come up and lay it on the table today. God is here with us as he's calling you, as he's calling me to a higher level with our great king.
Thank you. 